Welcome to the Voice of Mountain Sledding, the Mountain Sledder Podcast with Mike Reed. Hey, Jay, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited for today's episode. Yeah, thank you, too. Thank you for reaching out. So I'm here in Alberta, Canada right now. Where are you at? I'm on the east coast of uh, northern Sweden. Northern Sweden. So how much daylight do you get right now, then? Uh, Well, it's about six, seven hours. So you'd be like similar to like Alaska type stuff, like Anchorage. Uh, yeah. Well, we're further north than Anchorage. Oh, okay, you're up there. Anchorage, it's like uh, southern Sweden. So you've it's been a while since you've been in Canada and riding in North America, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been a while. I think it's uh, was it 2018. Yep. Last time I rode, I think. Crazy to think it's already been six years. Like we think 18, you're like, oh, it's only been a few years, but it's been six years already. I know. Time just flies by. Do you miss it? Do you miss riding North America? Uh, of course I do. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's a whole different whole game. Bigger mountains, a lot more snow and everything. Yeah. And that area where you're living right now, is there much riding right in your region? Uh, well, I can ride right from my door. but. We don't have that much snow, and uh, the mountains are not that big. It's yep. like little rolly hills. Okay. But the terrain is actually pretty fun here, too. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's nice to be able to just go out and rip for an hour in the evening. Is there a pretty big scene right around there, or are sleds in your region mainly used for like work purposes? No, the sled scene is big here. We have. Uh, I think it's the world's biggest snowmobile club right here. Oh, wow. Are are you putting in your name for president of the club or anything? Are you a member of the club or how does that work? I'm actually on the board of the club Uh, too. So I, and I'm responsible for, for a part of the, of the trail too. Nice KJ. I'm proud of you for giving back to the local sled community. Well, that's cool. One of the largest sled clubs in the world. So you've got a big membership probably an eclectic mix of snowmobiles over there from old to new to different manufacturers oh yeah it's uh it's a big mix and uh so it's anything from work sleds to mountain sleds yeah so you've got a nice networked uh groom network of trails around there then oh yeah you can uh there's a new trail here right now you can go from uh from town here on the east coast all the way to the west coast norway oh wow that is opening up uh, this winter so this will be the first year of opening it then yeah so cool so the the areas that i've been hearing for the past couple of years when people go up there in the springtime they always talk about like what's called i would i'm probably butchering the name but rick scranton is that yeah. is that kind of the main area that you would go if you could ride anywhere in sweden uh yeah, I will go there, especially in the spring. Like this time of year, it's so far north, so it's uh, it's dark. You're considered south right now. You're tropical, probably. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like they they don't have much daylight this time of year, but, but that turns around in uh, March, April. Yeah. So, what kind of weather are you dealing with? Like, how cold has it been? Like. The last week here in Alberta, it was like minus 50, minus 60 with the wind chill. What are you guys dealing with? Oh, wow. Uh, last few days, we have had minus 18, 20. Okay. And the coldest we had this winter was a few weeks ago. Then it was minus 25. Okay. So pretty reasonable then. Not Nothing too, too crazy. Yeah. No, it's been, uh, it's been a good winter. It's been... Uh, it's been minus since November, I think. Okay. With a few odd days where it's been uh, a few degrees plus, but uh, but mainly it's been around five, ten degrees. Oh, nice. So I've been following your social media pages lately and was watching some of these sled builds that you've been conjuring up, and you're always known for, you know, tinkering on this and that and fabbing things up. I think it's in your nature, maybe every Swedish guy's nature, but what are you riding right now? Uh, well, right now I'm riding uh, 
some uh, home built uh, mix <laughs> that I created a few years ago. And take us through it, like from ski stance to riding position to track. What's the amalgam? Like, what different parts and pieces and manufacturers have you pulled from to build this thing? Well, the the tunnel is from a uh, it's a 2019 Lynx. I have a Lynx tunnel and skid. That's about the stock parts that is on the sled. The rest is uh, built up from scratch. So, so how wide is it? So the ski stance is uh, 25 inch. So I basically built it to look like a, an old uh, Swedish brand, Okkelbo. Okay. They used to make sleds in Sweden. And they have uh, one model that is really narrow. They got 25 inch stance and a pretty long track too. So it's like a little missile. It's narrow and long and super nimble. It's narrow, right? long, and the engine sits on top of the tunnel, like on the old uh, Edo Elan. Yep. And uh, that's how I built mine too. So I, I'm using an Articat 600 from a race sled. Okay. And uh, so I have that mounted up on top of the tunnel in centered yeah so it it sticks out a little bit on both sides but it's kind of as wide as the bars and then i shortened down a skidoo drive shaft to make it narrower and uh, i'm using i actually using an s module from a i don't know if it's a Lynx or a skidoo but one of the S modules, and that's bolted straight on the front of the tunnel. So I don't have an S module at all. It's just an extension of the tunnel, essentially. It's just an extension of the tunnel. So that makes the whole sled about a, almost a foot shorter. Wow. So I, I, don't, I don't have very much heat pressure. I guess not. And, uh, <laughs> and you stand quite a bit further back, too. When you ride, even if the the geometry from the S module is the same as on a skidoo or Lynx, so that puts the whole steering post almost a foot further back too. This episode of the Mountain Sledder Podcast is brought to you by Mountain Sports Distribution and ShopMSD.com, your source for top brands in sledding and power sports. From 509 to Highmark, 2B to CFR, and their exclusive line of Mountain Lab gear, MSD is where you can find products tailored to meet the needs of serious backcountry power sports users. Mountain Sports Distribution has constantly been expanding their line of products each year, and I always look forward to what comes out next. From a custom Mountain Lab toolkit which contains everything needed no matter what brand you ride, to super bright headlamps and even gear bags and tie-downs, any outerwear and safety gear you need for riding, basically everything you'll need in a day of riding, you'll find at shopmsd.com. Upgrade your riding experience this season by visiting shopmsd.com. Top quality brands for your backcountry adventures. Wow. So I, what do you think it does best? Uh, well, best is uh, high trees and uh, steep side hills. Yeah. So like kind of slow speed boondocking where you're just kind of like breaking trail and yeah. tighter sections. Yeah. Yeah. And the most terrain we have around here is uh, pretty tight trees and fairly steep little, little mountains. Do you think if a manufacturer approached you to give you any resources, you know, the funding, the peat personnel, the CAD machines, everything, the you know, everything you'd need to build this machine, would you build something like that? Or, or where do you think you would go with what's in your mind of, you know, big alpine stuff in Canada versus the tight trees you're riding? What would you do? What would the ski stands be? What would the track length be? What kind of horsepower would you turn out of it? Oh, that, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure if I would build it like this with an engine on top of the tunnel because it has its drawbacks. It's it's fi actually fine when you ride it, but if you if you tip over, it 
pretty top heavy to get back up. Okay, yeah. Uh, that's about the drawbacks I've seen, and the it wheel is quite a bit too, since the uh, center of gravity is so high. Right, that'd be a lot of fun for the the slower speed boondock. And how do you think it would do with some of the stuff that you used to ride in North America, like the high speed big airs that you used to do? How would it, how would it do in like airing it out like that? Uh, well, I hit some pretty good airs with that too, and. Uh, Definitely a little bit narrow in the front. That's uh, it's uh, interesting on the in run. <laughs> in the air, it's fine, and uh, the landings can be tricky too. Oh, that's awesome! Um, so the six hundred Articat, you just went with that because it's what you had around available to you. That's what I could find available. So, do you think that? sled that you built kind of needs a bit more power like if you could get an 850 you would put one in but you know right now probably just doesn't even need it i probably would but uh, the 600 works pretty good too and i mean we're low altitude too so right it's uh, actually fine what kind of weight do you think it is have you ever measured it well i put it on scales and i got it to 218 Ready to ride, full with fuel and everything. That's kilos, though, right? Ah, uh, kilos. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's two point two conversion for the pounds. So that'd be what, like four hundred and fifty pounds, kind of thing. Uh, somewhere around there. Very cool, KJ. I'm proud of you for sticking it out over there and building your own sled and being involved in the in the scene there and giving back to the club. Are you thinking about coming back to North America anytime soon? I'm actually planning a trip. Uh, there in March this year for uh, some film project. Nice. Can you tell us more about it or is it top secret? It's a little bit secret still, but I'm going to be riding with uh, with Monster and uh, uh, McNulty. Oh, nice. You know, I think if you open the door, if everyone listened to this podcast, your phone would be blowing up the minute you landed in Canada for people that would want to see you and hang out with you and ride with you because you had a big, pretty big following when you were riding and living in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be fun to see everyone and do some riding there. So those guys have lined you up with a sled? I, I hope so. <laughs> I, I don't have all the details yet, but they were going to arrange something. Awesome. Well, what if any sled you could ride right now, if they could line you up anything, any manufacturer, what would you be riding if you could pick anything? I, I would love to try the new Articat. Yeah. 858. Yeah, that kind of I doubt. But I doubt that will be possible. Yeah. But I mean, they're, they're all good. The Polaris is good. The Articat is good. The Skidoo is good. Lynx. They're all working pretty well right now, especially with the NA. Are you excited to try a stock? turbocharged sled because you were a big turbo guy back but you were building them from the ground up and you know they were never as refined as what the oems can do are you excited to try a factory turbo oh yeah that will be super super exciting i've tried them here and uh, they definitely work good it's pretty wild the amount of power maybe not squeezing as much as you were out of your turbos back in the day but the fact that you could just pull and go and assume that thing's going to last forever is pretty nice isn't it Oh, yeah. And the rideability, like the throttle response and everything. It's night and day what I use to ride. Yeah, the ones that you were building were probably really good top end, but probably lacked a little bit on that like tighter boondocking that you're describing you're currently riding a lot of. Yeah. I mean, I, I rode my turbo kit for, I don't know, five years too. So it's, I went through a couple of motors. What was your favorite sled? In all the era of, say, when you and I were working with sled next together and, and that stuff, what was your favorite era? What was your favorite sled, do you think? Like, the one that stands out to me the most is probably your Yellow Hood Cat. But what did you like? Uh, well, I love that sled. and uh, I mean, the old damn chassis, it was, it was a really good chassis. Yeah. It was durable. Uh, you could always count on them, kind of. Well, you could, because you could just fix it if anything went awry with it. Whereas other people, I think, just expected it to keep running. And if they had any faults, it was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. But I mean, the, the pro climbs were good too. Yeah. Yep. They were a really good chassis. 
And you made them look good, I must admit. You and I began filming for Sladnex, was it like 2011 probably or 2010 or something? Yeah, I started filming for Sladnex 2010. Yeah. yeah. And I think you came on the scene pretty hard right off the bat. You were establishing yourself as one of the premier riders of the day, you know, doing big step downs, big, big airs in general. But back in that day, the West Coast seemed to have a little bit more active scene. It almost seemed like where filming was done out there more often. And, you know, there was a, a pretty big group of riders that were pushing each other, um, especially in the film scene. But, um, you know, that's now picked up by, like you mentioned, Munster and McNulty and some of those guys. Um, do you like, was that some of the highlights of your life living with some of those guys, pushing them, riding with them on a, you know, week to week basis? Oh yeah, for sure. It's, uh, and I mean, a lot of the riders were role models from when I started sledding kind of. I mean, Chris Brown and, uh, Jeff Kyle, Fredway, all those guys. Yeah, there was almost like a change of the guard happening in that era, wasn't there, where the Jeff Kyles and Treadways and Rob Alfords and BJ Murray and those kind of guys were probably already out of there, but Chris Brown and that, where they're still kind of around and riding and they love the sport, but maybe not as much in front of the camera as they used to be. And then the up-and-comers like yourself or Brad Gilmore. Um, yeah, there's quite a few of you guys that were just coming up, following in, in their footsteps, and it was cool to see when we get out on film shoots where it was like Treadway and you, you know, riding together, it, it just seemed like you guys grew up watching them. Now you're doing it and pushing each other. And it was a really cool dynamic when we were filming those parts for sure. Yeah. 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 No, we had really good crews and we had a lot of fun riding too. You definitely had a style where it was like, backcountry but big backcountry like i remember one of our heli shoots for 509 one of the first years of we were filming with them together and it was like the stuff you were doing was just pretty like expanded over what some of the other riders were maybe pushing at the time i want to think like jay marinberry was doing some pretty big step downs and things like that and then with this boosted sled and i don't know if it was because of the boost or the horsepower you're pushing or what but just like able to do some really big airs and it was super impressive. That was a fun shoot. I remember that. What What made you? Why do you think you had such good air awareness, or what made you go bigger than you know? Say if someone else is doing something, you're like, I think I'm going to tranny to the next, you know, little knoll or wherever. Well, I've always liked going big, so and uh, I guess I kind of had good good control in there too. And uh, I was usually able to hit the landing that I where I wanted to land to. But I mean, it's, it's a lot of practice behind that. I was going to say, like, where did that come from? Was it all sledding or was it moto as well? Or where did you get that, you know, good feeling in the air? Well, it's both from sledding and, and moto. I used to ride on the track here a lot. And I have my own little compound down here too with uh, some ramp set up and some dirt jumps uh, I, I've had I've been hitting big airs for quite some time and did you start like when you and I first met you were already in Canada but were you pushing boundaries in Sweden before you came to North America uh, yeah definitely I, I started filming here in like 0203 kind of that area and who was that with? And like, where were the, some of the other riders you were riding with? Like the Daniel Bodines or who? I never really rode with Bodine, but uh, some local riders from here and uh, the Rough Rider crews from up north. When you left Sweden and you came to North America, was it, was it like a change of culture as well? Like, did you notice the film style and the riding groups and stuff like that change or, or is it pretty like worldwide when you're a sledder you're just a sledder uh, yeah kind of it's uh, pretty much the same type of people but i mean the whole scene was different way different mountains different approach towards avalanches and stuff like that because we had never ridden with 
heavy gear when I first came there, but then uh, everyone was using it, and uh, so it just became natural. To me, riding with the Dan Treadways and, and people like that who have firsthand experienced it, do you think that's where you picked up a lot of your avi awareness and knowledge, just riding with them and and them sharing it with you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, the first two years I was in uh, in Canada, we didn't do that much filming. We were mainly just uh, mainly just riding for fun. But we rode often with snowboarders, so we picked up a lot from there. The zones that you were accessing, did you poach some of that from the knowledge of the snowboarders as well, or was that something that you kind of got just from the sledders, or were you doing a lot of exploring on your own those first couple of years? Oh, we explored a lot by ourselves too, but, but we were often going with some locals too, so we, we got some hints where to go and where not to go and stuff like that. And, what was your favorite segment if you were to look back still in those days of living in North America? What was the one that stands out to you about being like, oh, I was the most proud of that one, or I think we put the most effort into that one? It might have been the, my first Slednik segment in uh, Slednik 13. That was, uh, that was a good one. It was pretty burly. Had a lot of big hits in it. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the standout for you was just the weather the season, the sled that you were on working with that filmer. And was it yearly at the time that you were working with or who were you working with for a filmer? Uh, yeah, that was yearly that year. Yes. And I think the two of you definitely living in that region, the West coast together, were able to like really put a lot of focus into what you were doing, you know, the timing, watching weather, hitting at the right time and doing the right, you know, zones. And I think you it showed when you guys, kicked out a segment because it was like definitely a lot of work put into it oh yeah no he, he was picky he didn't he didn't put any in any shots that was even the slightest shaky or anything <laughs> do you so, think there's quite a bit of footage left over that still could be re-edited or used to this day oh yeah yeah that's Weeks of footage. But probably a ton of fun when you guys went out there scouting and finding all those locations and getting out there and seeing the end product. You were probably pretty blown away. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, again, given the right circumstances, the right weather, the right snowpack, the right machine, you could go out and kick out a better segment heading back to Canada this March. I don't know if I would say better segment, but uh, probably going to be a little bit different. Yeah. Do you think your riding has improved since those days? Or do you think, like most of us, as we get older, we're kind of like, <laughs> leave that spine tingling stuff behind us? Yeah, a little bit. I, I mean, uh, we're not getting younger. And I haven't done any big drops in, yeah, since I was in Canada last time. Who do you look at as like a young up-and-comer that's, that is filling your void in the sport? Oh, uh, Caleb and... Uh, so bad at names. So Caleb Kasturki, you're thinking, right? Yeah. And uh, who else? Uh, Andreas Bergmark from yeah. Sweden. Yep. He got pretty similar style as I have, I think. He also likes to go big. and He certainly does. Do you ever wonder what could have been had you had a big energy sponsor like Andreas has? I definitely would have helped because... I mean, <laughs> I mean, I was scrambling every season, and uh, you you see in the sleds I've been riding too. I mean, it it would help if I if you had at least a current year sled and maybe a spare one too. <laughs> yeah, a primary and a backup, at least for parts, right? Because a lot of the time, yeah, when you're trying to film a segment, a lot of like, I remember you and I spending time down in the heated garage just working on the sled you know, trying to get it ready for the next day of filming. So it's not like we could focus on like rest and recuperation. It was like just trying to get the thing breathing fire again so we could go out the next day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it was it was usually long days of filming and then long nights of preparing. Has he reached out to you at all to do any sort of collaboration efforts in Sweden there while he films out that way on his big five? Uh, no, we haven't. But he was he was down here last winter not too far from here 
maybe this can be a shout out to suggest that he reaches out to you and you guys collaborate on something so and i'm sure a lot of watchers a lot of viewers would love to see that a collaboration between the two of you oh yeah for sure that would be fun <laughs> again on your social media i've been following and you're taking a cnc machine and you're building your own drivers out of it so what's your profession like what is your job title and how do you have access to all this equipment yeah so i, I work at a machine shop so i'm i'm running a big uh, cnc machine and uh, actually those drivers i didn't do in a cnc machine i was i made them in a handheld little wood milling machine <laughs> i think it's called a router no it turned out okay i I rode the sled last weekend. So, how do you do the math and everything to figure that out? I guess it's just part of your job description to understand the pitch of the driver and the circumference of it and everything else. Oh yeah, no, it was definitely a little bit of calculations before I got everything right. But <laughs> and where do you get the plastic from? Where do you source all the materials from? Well, I had a sheet of plastic here, so. I just took whatever I had and made it happen. That's wild. I love it. For all the listeners are just like, I could buy Avid drivers or whatever and still press them on. But like to actually build my own drivers is, that's another level of engineering good for you. Yeah, but that option wasn't available. You couldn't drive any, buy any drivers. So but it, it's on an old sled too. It's on a... 1975 uh, links <laughs> but this is this is a different sled this is another project oh yeah i have like six or seven sleds here but they're all they're all old so it's, it's between 75 and uh i would say 2005 okay i have a pretty big spectrum <laughs> and it just Matters of how you're feeling that day versus which one you're going to take out on the trail or what? Yeah, I mean, I, I never go on the trail. So is there lots of like river banks and small knoll hills like that? Are you guys riding like creeks and rivers quite a bit? Uh, yeah, quite a bit. But it's mainly little little mountains. Okay. It's, uh, we're on um, the high coast of Sweden. So this is an area where the... We had about two kilometers of ice during the ice age. And the land is still still rising about a, I think it's a centimeter every year. Okay. So all the mountains here are, they're pretty shaved on top. So it's, uh, they're fairly round and uh, not much growing on them. So it's kind of like subalpine terrain and the rocks are pretty smooth so it's not you don't need a lot of snow to to be able to ride what is your typical snow pack like how deep does it usually get well last year was a good year then we had uh 640 centimeter i'd usually around a meter or three feet so definitely enough to get stuck oh yeah it's not enough to get stuck and i mean if the, if the terrain is is forgiving it's you don't need that much so you guys are on the east coast of sweden about how far from say stockholm then are you it's about 600 kilometer north of stockholm okay and then rick's granson is another what 800 kilometers north of you yeah something like that okay so you're like halfway up then a little bit more than halfway so riding's very popular around you you've got a great club obviously with one of the biggest in the world and a great network of trails that go all the way from the west, east coast to the west coast. But still you find yourself coming back to Canada for the mountains, aren't you? Yeah, of course. And for the actual paid work, you're working on greater components right now. Yeah, right now it's, it's uh, very mixed. It's every, anything from graders to sawmills and mining equipment. Big, heavy industrial stuff. Yeah, I... I mean, the machine I'm running takes material up to three meters long and 800 millimeter in diameter. So it's a, it's a big machine. It's, it's a little bit too big to make little, little stuff, but we have other machines too. How is life for you right now? Are you enjoying the work 
family life sledding balance right now? Oh yeah, no, it's it's definitely good to be settled down and settled down in a place. And uh, so I'm me and my wife. We bought my parents' farm that I grew up in. Oh no way! So I'm uh, I'm on a hundred acre farm with mainly forest. So most of the riding I'm doing is actually on my own property. Oh, that's fantastic. So what are you guys farming right now? Take us through what farm life with KJ is like. Well, our farm life is uh, limited to chickens. right now, And uh, we got shared custody with a neighbor. So we have them every, every second week. Oh, I see. So they're, they can free range. Oh, yeah. Nice. So in the summer, they just run around outside and Right now, they're in uh, in Coop. So, 100 acres is a lot of land for just chickens. What else do you guys farm? Like, what is primarily farmed out there in Sweden? Well, it's not a whole lot around here these days. There's a a few dairy farmers, but it's mainly horse farms. Is it pretty unique to own... 100 acres in Sweden, like some areas in Europe, it's like if you didn't get it handed down to you or, you know, in the lineage of family, it's you're not buying or you're not able to get land in certain areas. Is it kind of like that in Sweden or is it, you know, fairly open? Uh, it's fairly open up here, but it's, uh, it's kind of harder. It's uh, definitely more attractive to be in the, on the countryside. So how far from a major city are you then? Uh, we're only seven kilometers. And so you're living in the same farmhouse that you grew up in on the same farm. And then you went to school like seven kilometers away, basically. That's so cool. And where did your folks move to then? Uh, my mom lives just next door. They're, they're, they're close. My grandparents built, built that house in, in the 70s. And they've owned it since then? Like uh, your grandparents have owned this land and farm did as well? It's been in the family for, I think we're the fifth or sixth generation. So I, I'm pretty sure it's been in the family since it's built. In, and it's from 1860, I think we found some newspapers from. Wow. That's so cool. So how big is the city yeah. near you then? It's about 60,000 people, I think. Okay. So it's got everything you would need then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know it got everything. And we got the hockey team uh, moto. You probably know the Sedin brothers, Horsberg. Yep. So they all originate from right there. Yeah. And you, did you play hockey growing up? I didn't play in any clubs or anything, but we played for fun. Because there's, there's hockey rinks. Uh, every school has a hockey rink, pretty much. And uh, you decided you were better at snowmobiling than you were hockey? Yeah, it was more fun to ride sled to the hockey rink than... <laughs> <laughs> play, play the hockey. Play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. Bring your skates when you come to Canada and you can strap them back up and play while you're over here. Yeah. Well, my son is actually playing there in, in Whistler. So that would be, that would be pretty fun. How old is he now? He's uh, nine. Does it look like he's going to be getting into sledding like his old man did? I think so. He's uh, definitely, he's been riding since. It was around three. It's definitely out there. Do you think uh, backcountry is in his future? Do you think backcountry snowmobiling and sl- snowboarding and all that? Yeah, um, probably. But I hope he can hold it back a little bit. I mean, you don't have to rush out there. It's a lot that can happen out there. Are you worried now? You imagine what your parents thought of when you were out there in Canada by yourself, sledding every day. They're probably worried now the coin is flipped and you're starting to be concerned for your kids. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I, I started to understand what they went, went through. <laughs> and what are the, some of the things that you'd teach them, you know, if you could when you're back there? Like, what, are, what obviously, Avi conditions under sand and snowpack, but it seemed like you had a better knack for not just that, but general overall survival and, you know, fixing a sled if you had to. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up, was sledding here in Sweden, so I've been I've been riding since some five six years. I mean, the backcountry here is different. You can always walk out home if you break down. While out there, it's a different story. 
So it's just bigger, you think, and that's the biggest thing to understand is just like how removed you are from safety or from, you know, a warm pickup truck at the end of the day, it would be a long walk for sure. Oh yeah. And it's not always you have service and uh, I mean, phone can die and weather can come in and just so many things that can happen. What was the farthest you ever explored when you were living out there in Pemberton, Whistler area? Like how far back did you ever go? I guess we have gone 100, 150 kilometers from the parking lot sometimes. Yeah. I remember one mission, we weren't that far, but we just did a big loop and a big tour. And I want to say we put on like 170K that day, you know, not in a straight line away from the trucks, but <laughs> we put on a lot of kilometers. You can cover a lot of ground when you get up on the ice cap. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. What was your favorite zone to ride when you lived out there? I mean, you hear the popular Brandywine and Rutherford and all these areas. What was your favorite area to ride? Mm, good question. Uh, and you can't give away secrets, can you? Well, maybe you can because you don't even live in Canada anymore. Yeah. No, we had have, we have one zone uh, behind the Cameron Ice Cap that was always fun to go back to. But it, it was far. It was uh, like an 80 kilometer right in there yeah pretty serious mission just to get back there and then did you prefer it because of the terrain and it just lent itself to doing like really good filming and riding yeah i mean the the train was sick and uh it was usually no tracks back there either but i mean whistler pemberton area they got so many different areas so as long as it's not tracked out and that was good it's it's good most areas there do you miss the vibe like living so close to Vancouver and Whistler being such a like international destination for tourists to come to? Do you miss like being able to pop down to the West Coast for, you know, plus 10 degree day or plus five in the middle of winter? Uh, well, I rarely ever did. So it's, uh, <laughs> I can't say I really miss that. So you weren't one to go in the hustle and bustle of Vancouver anyway. You just liked it out in the country. No. No, I did anything I could to avoid that. When you were sledding and we were doing some filming, you had, was it an old Dodge, I think, a silver old 12-valve Dodge, or maybe it was a 24-valve? Yeah, it was a 24-valve. Early 2000s then? Yeah, oh two. Yeah. And what are you driving over in Sweden right now? Anything that big and bulky? and? Uh, no. <laughs> what do you got? No... <laughs> I am uh, riding or driving a four by four uh, 2008 uh, Skoda. So it's kind of like a Volkswagen, uh, yeah, just a little, little car. And then if you're traveling with your sled, are you towing a trailer then? Yeah, so we have an enclosed trailer that fits two sleds, maybe three if you're squeezing a little bit. And that's kind of the scene there, isn't it? Where most people just kind of use their SUVs or whatever to tow a small trailer and tow sleds. Oh yeah, there, there's no reason to have a big truck here. It's just a waste of money, I would say. And fuel prices are pretty extreme over there, aren't they? Oh yeah, it's about $3 a liter now. Okay. I would say. Yep. But it's been up to, I would say, 4 It just went down... Uh, this new year or do you have any plans on getting a new sled or anything like that or is there any need for anything i'll see but i usually get to get to borrow some some sled whenever we need to film but otherwise i'm i'm pretty stoked on uh, the sled that i built i want to spend some more time on that too because i haven't ridden it that much i i rode last season but i didn't do any and the trips to the mountains really last year. So we had a pretty good snowpack here. So if we were to watch some of your films from over there, what who are you filming with these days? Yeah, we have some episodes on uh, the spot the platforms. Well, very cool. So you got a plan of coming here in March. What else this spring for you over in Sweden? Well, I got a group of uh, people from Greenland coming uh, in a week or so i'm gonna do some riding with here because i i did a trip there in 2019 is 
pretty good riding riding over there is it kind of similar to what you guys got i would say it's more like the west coast mountain in canada it's, it, they got pretty big mountains over there yeah but it's all alpine not a single tree it's like <laughs> nothing in sight <laughs> nothing in sight and it, it was pretty windblown when we were there too so the snow wasn't the best but it was pretty an epic adventure anyway how were the towns like what was the culture like when you were there is it you know similar to what you guys run for suvs and get into the mountains and the travel and all that or was it a pretty different experience that way uh it was totally different because uh we were traveling with boats so we had a we had a big uh, it's an old army boat yeah so we loaded up like 14 sleds on the boat and we had a chef on the boat oh wow and we were just cruising around to different spots so and accessed it all through boat that's so cool yeah oh yeah that was that was super cool so obviously your you know your elevation super low but then how high do you eventually get in some of these mountains well on greenland i think we were up on like two thousand meter okay at some point yeah so like six thousand feet type thing yeah no so it's it's decent size mountains there too and the snowpack was a little bit subpar when you were there, but you like it. It gets pretty good, you think? Uh, yeah, then I see in footage from where it's really good. And, uh, I mean, we have decent snow some days too. So you've been to North America, you've been to Greenland, you've rode Sweden, of course. Where else have you been riding? Uh, not that many other places. I've been to Norway. Uh, I haven't ridden anything in Finland, but. I don't think they have very much worry about riding there either. So out of all the Scandinavian countries and, and most of Europe that you're able to ride in, is that kind of area you're in the Mecca for snowmobiling then? I, I would say so. They, there's some spots down in the Alps too you can ride, but it's, it's very, very limited down there. Yeah, I've kind of seen some stuff maybe in Italy where they were using helis to access like tiny little bowls or zones and that's kind of all you could really ride. Are you familiar with anything else outside of that or is that kind of all of kind of Central Europe's opportunity for sledding? Well, a friend of mine had been to Croatia, I think. Oh, okay. Riding there. And he said it was pretty decent terrain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did they get sleds there? You just load up and drive on. Oh, wow. That would have been a big mission. That would have been a long time getting there, wouldn't it? Well, it's like driving to Colorado or Alaska. or. <clears throat> and when you're there, there's no support. If you do break apart or something like that, you be better have a backup sled. Uh, yeah, actually, they, they were riding with the locals that had sleds and everything. Oh, okay, so. cool. So there, there is scenes all over the place. Maybe we got to look into Croatia. Maybe you and I will meet there next. There were some pretty epic pictures you posted. Um, it was quite a few years ago now where you're riding on the ocean with a water sled. Yeah. So that was that surf spot just north of town here. And did you race the water series for a few years, didn't you? Like you got pretty big into it? I would say I got really big into it, but I definitely raced. I was I was seeing it in the right in the start when it started to get popular around two thousand five. Okay. Two thousand four, I think I did my first race. And how did you fare up? I mean, obviously you're a pretty experienced, like badass backcountry rider, but how did you do on the water? Uh, I would say not not too bad. I so then in uh, two thousand twelve, I got to borrow that Polaris from a uh, from a team here in Sweden. I did the European Championship, I think then. And my first round, I ended up on like, third place or something. So no, not too bad. Yeah, good job. Do you think if you had the option to do like moto in the summer or snowmobiling on water, which would you choose? I think snowmobiling on water. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, it's it's super fun. But I, I'm not a I'm not a huge uh, race kind of guy. I I like the free riding way better. There is something about that 
competitive scene where it just changes everything, doesn't it? Like you're not just going out there to have fun with your friends and laugh and high five. It's like you look next to you and you want to beat that guy or woman or whoever you're oh, racing yeah, yeah. against. It's like you got to get out there and just like try and get the checkered flag. And it changes the whole dynamic to the day, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. It, it's a fun scene to be in. I, I know most of the people, so it's, uh, it's usually really good vibes in the, in the pit and everything around is just, I love that. It's a lot of hard work to be on the, in the top. I mean, you, you need to have a really serious build set and it takes a lot, a lot of time. Speaking of the comp- competitive nature of snowmobiling, did you ever think of like, or imagine how you would do going down to a place like Jackson Hole and racing in the Rimshaw, like the hill climbing circuit? Oh, uh, I thought about it, but uh, I don't really know. I I probably wouldn't do bad, but it's... Uh, I think you... I, I mean, I, I'd rather go free ride for a day than... <laughs> be on a ski <laughs> hill. i to go up those ruts, yeah. Yeah. You've got about the same build as Keith Curtis. I think you'd be long and lanky and you'd be able to maneuver the sled pretty easily up there. Uh, yeah, probably. But I mean, uh, I, I would say I, I'd rather race in Jackson where it's really ruddy and shitty than to go high speed up a groomed ski uh, hill. <laughs> Something that's techy and a little bit slower and requires a lot of nerves. You, have you seen how steep Jackson is? Are you sure you'd want to go up there? Uh, <laughs> well, I've only seen it on uh, on the screen, but I can only imagine it's it's steep. You're right, though. It it's it's like anything when you're competing at that level, whether it's water cross or rimshaw or snow cross or anything. You need the proper training, the proper experience, the proper built sled to assume you're going to be, you know, at the top, sharp end of the finishing podium spots. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've done some uh, hill cross racing here in Sweden, and I did uh, I did a hill climb race up in Alaska once that I actually won. So I, oh, you did win it. Was that at the tailgate Alaska yeah. that you went up to, and there was that iconic shot of you doing that huge hip up off that wind lip? Yeah, I think that might have been the same trip. It's uh, it's called the uh, Mountain Man Hill Climb. Okay. So it's just an uh, open space on a backcountry mountain you ride up through a few gates. Oh, okay. So there was like some gates to maneuver and it was a timed event. It wasn't just like a heads up. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it was timed. It was, it was gates and everything. So oh, Okay. But I mean, it, it's different when it's in the backcountry. It's totally different terrain and most of the terrain was natural too. It, it, it was it was a fun, fun thing to do. Retake us through that clip. The one I'm talking about where you were like a huge whip up above some sort of wind lip. And you were like, it looked like you were like 25 feet above the deck. Yeah, that was, that was high. <laughs> Did you land that one? Uh, I, not that specific one I landed. I landed on the side and like stayed on the sled but yeah. i didn't ride out of it but I, I did a few smaller ones that i landed but uh yeah no that was a that was a big takeoff you could carry as much speed as you dared to into it oh yeah and i, I was i was going as fast as i could on the turbo you mentioned some of the up-and-comers like caleb kasturki that you've been watching what are they doing that impresses you from a viewer from you know just sitting at home on your farm on a hundred acres watching, you know, some of the Insta reels or Facebook, what are they doing where you're like, Oh, that is so cool that they're doing that. Well, nowadays everyone is writing a lot more technical. I mean, all those hop overs. I guess we have to blame Buran for that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I haven't practiced that a lot, but it, I mean, the places they can go when they have the right technique is just ridiculous. Do you think that scene would have been different had you had, you know, the sleds that they do today when you were in your pinnacle of riding? Uh, yeah, it definitely would have been different. Because, I mean, try to do that on an M-series, it's, it's a different ball game. 
Yeah, you probably would feel a little bit more sore at the end of the day if you're trying to get into some of the tight areas that they're riding currently. Oh yeah, no, it's uh, the sleds have gone a long way. It's uh, those new Polaris and the Skidoo's and things as well. It's they're way different now than they were 15 years ago. When uh, you mentioned you're going to come to Canada in March and you're going to link up with Munster and McNulty. It almost seems like Munster has a very similar style to what you were doing when you were riding out there on the West Coast as far as like big whips, big re-entry type stuff where he just like hangs it out a little bit higher, longer than a lot of the other guys. Oh yeah, no, he definitely has a good, good style. It's, uh, you can tell it's, it's planned a lot. He doesn't just go out and hope for the best and do something. Yeah, no, he's, he's definitely a planner. That's usually what I did too. I mean, we were improvising a lot too, but it's definitely a lot of planning that goes behind, especially those bigger hits. Does a lot of that come from riding that area for a while and looking at the certain, let's say, features or hits that you want to do for so long that you're like, oh, I can imagine doing it, you know, and one day I'm going to do it when the snow's right and everything. And then, so you've already like kind of planned it out in your head, the amount of times you rode by it. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's, uh, some lines you've been looking at for years, but it just haven't really felt right. And then all of a sudden, it's just boom. There it is. That looks perfect. And uh, then, I mean, I've done some lines 100 times in my head before I go do them. So you can pretty much do them blind and you know exactly where you are. In there. Well, do you think we can hook up when you come in March to get to Canada? Maybe I'll just so happen to be on the West Coast at the same time. Yeah, for sure. That would be super fun. Bug McNulty and Munster and tell them Reeve's going to come out for a couple of days at least. <laughs> we got to hook up. It's been way too long. No, that would be super fun. Well, keep riding, polishing your skills until then because I think whatever they've got planned for you is going to be <laughs> is going to be pretty uh, hectic, but exhausting, but a lot of fun too, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, cool, KJ. Thanks so much for hopping on this podcast with us. Um, I know I could speak for a lot of viewers when you were filming for Slednex and 509 and everyone that uh, you still got a lot of following out there that are wondering, what are you up to these days? So it was awesome to catch up with you. Yeah, no, it was good to catch up with you too. And yeah, everything is good here, but it will be fun to get out there and ride too. Absolutely. Okay, buddy. Well, thanks so much. I know it's late there, so go get some rest, get ready for work again tomorrow. and. Keep posting yeah. all the new things that you've been working on and building as far as sled components because it's been so entertaining to watch. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll try to get better at it. We're a long ways away. I can't just pop next door to see what you're up to. No, I wish you could. It's, uh, I got a lot to show you. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I'll make it a priority to try and get out to Sweden here one of these springs. Oh, yeah, you should. I got some sleds for you to ride to. I, I'll take the 1975 model. That'll be mine. Oh, yeah. You will get that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, buddy. Talk soon. Yeah, sounds good. Take care.